So we're going to start really basic with the functions of the endocrine system, and then we'll delve into some of the similarities and differences between the nervous system and the endocrine. And then finally, we'll move into some discussions about hormones and glands, and I'll interweave those things together when we do our, when we look at the different glands. And then I'll conclude today by showing you a summary chart and then the key difference between the endocrine and exocrine. All right, so uh, what are the functions of the endocrine system? Well, think about that for a second. So you may have heard of the word endocrine before. In your current line of work, maybe you have the opportunity to work with endocrinologists. The endocrinology field is a really interesting one. It's a specialty in the field of medicine that focuses on the treatment of endocrine disorders. The doctors that are endocrinologists, you know, really are going to focus on pathologies that are associated with hormones, you know, and regulating uh, different hormones in the body, looking at specific glands that might need uh, some monitoring, endocrine glands, or you can also call them endocrine cells. And sometimes, you know, the endocrinologist can order different tests. Basically, that kind of lends into, you know, I think you're really going a little more into these functions. So we can summarize the functions by saying the endocrine system is the production and regulation of hormones, right? And so hormones again, are, are chemical substances in our bodies, all right? They control nearly all the processes in our bodies, and they help to coordinate many of our body's functions. We're talking about hormones and associated functions. We're talking about a lot of different things, from metabolism and growth all the way to sleep. Let's talk about how the nervous system and endocrine system relate. Certainly, they complement each other. They're both involved in coordination and control. We, we saw that in a variety of ways with the nervous system, both voluntary and involuntary control we looked at. Um, if you remember when we were talking about somatic and autonomic or, you know, somatic and visceral, depending on if we were looking at the efferent or afferent, right? Uh, and so now we're going to look at more mechanisms of coordination and control. A lot of them uh, with the endocrine system are, are you know, involuntary. So, so we're going to kind of go through those today. And then, you know, another complementary feature of both systems is they both produce, you know, biologically active chemicals. You know, in certain circumstances, we're talking about fibers and neurons. And now uh, with the endocrine system, we're going to be talking about mostly hormones. Some parts of the brain are glands and some glands are nervous tissues. So there, uh, it, you know, some interrelationships there. Uh, and then also some responses we know begin as reflexes, right? And so we have our uh, sensory receptors. We have all different types of uh, chemoreceptors and uh, mechanoreceptors and nociceptors and so many different receptors, right? And, uh, you know, we know that some of those receptors can in, in some way, shape, or form continue and or end with a hormonal response, right? And, and thereby we have our different types of feedback loops that happen to uh, try to maintain homeostasis in our bodies. Okay, so here is a look at uh, one angle of the brain, just to give you an idea of the regions that we're going to be focusing in on today when we start our studies. But before we do that, a little more comparative uh, notes here. So we're looking at the endocrine and nervous systems. We uh, refer to things like signal signaling mechanisms, chemical signals, distance response, and environment. And we can see the corollaries uh, or, you know, even the correlating terms between the endocrine system and the nervous system in this chart. So as I said, we are going to compare and contrast. So let's look at uh, the contrasting aspects now. So because of the chemical properties of the hormones, there are very widespread effects in the case of the endocrine system. That definitely differs from the nervous system where things are localized within the cells or within a common path in the body, such as a fiber traveling or neur neuron traveling to the central nervous system, and then 
a motor response is firing and a specific motor response happening. And so we call those localized effects. A lot of times endocrine system uh, aspects can be longer lived. So things happen over time as opposed to, you know, the impulses and action potentials that we've talked about and, you know, reflex responses of the nervous system. So, so you, can, you can visualize some of those differences probably already there. Sometimes I think the best way to start a study is to look at a visual so we can really see the different glands that we'll be focusing on today. Now, most of the things on these pictures we will highlight today. I'm looking at this quickly. I can tell you that we're not going to really talk about the thymus. Pretty much everything else on here we're going to highlight uh, either in long or short form. All right, so this should help you with a couple of your mini essays there. So we'll start by jumping right into the glands. And um, I'd like to start today with the pituitary gland because this particular gland is very, very important, as are all the glands, but uh, this particular one happens to be known as the master endocrine gland of our body. You can see there where the pituitary is situated, right? It actually connects to our hypothalamus, right? So this is all part of the, the brain here, right? Specifically, the pituitary is located in actually the sphenoid bone. So think back to our study of the anatomy of the bones, particularly the bones of the brain case, right? The brain and the uh, facial bones. We talked about bones that were more superficial, bones that were deeper. And you probably remember us talking about the sphenoid bone. So this is actually within the sphenoid bone. And we can say, uh, based on its location, that it's at about the base of the brain. All right, so why exactly is uh, the pituitary gland important? Well, there's two halves of the pituitary gland. Uh, and we're going to learn that those two halves, and I'll get into this in a couple of slides, are the neurohypophysis and the adenohypophysis. So the neuro aspect you can probably guess, deals with the nervous system, right? And neurons, right? And then the adeno, um, that is a root for gland. All right, so the adenohypophysis is going to deal with the endocrine glands. Okay, so the endocrine system, endocrine glands and cells. Okay, so we'll be talking about that. Um, but before I get further into that, just note that the pituitary gland is secreting hormones to various key parts of our bodies. All right, so you're going to see that gland secrete hormones to our liver, uh, secrete hormones to the bones. Probably remember from our study of bones, we talked about osteoblasts. Do you guys remember that? And we talked about osteoclasts. So try to think back as to what those are. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts, all right? You probably remember those as the bone cells, right? So think about what the uh, purpose of the osteoblasts and osteoclasts was, all right? You're gonna see a lot of similarities with essentially the yin and yang, right? Yin and yang, where, um, you know, one is kind of working off of the other to maintain homeostasis. Uh, I'm going to go back to the slides here. We can delve into that a little bit further. So we know that the hormones are being produced and secreted. We know that one of the places they're being secreted to is specifically the bones, right? So the neurons are releasing the neurotransmitters into the bloodstream. And uh, what's being produced is a hormone at this point. So uh, here's where our endocrine system is coming in. Uh, you know, very much a hormone-based system, as we know. Uh, and the hormone being released is an antidiuretic, all right? So those that work in the clinic setting or the hospital setting, think about what you know about diuretics, right? So what is a diuretic? Well, a diuretic is a drug that makes you pee, right? 
So an antidiuretic, so we're using our prefix there, antidiuretic, of course, would mean to make you, um, you know, would make you retain the water. Uh, so that's the process there that's involved. And the other hormone being released here that's important to note, uh, and a lot of times we'll have, you know, one and then another hormone as part of these feedback loops that happen. The other hormone here being released is oxytocin, right? One of the ways that oxytocin plays a part in processes that happen in the body are in the process of milk production, all right? So when we're talking about lactation, uh, we have essentially feedback loop here that's happening, right? And it's a, it's a positive feedback loop because a change is being created in the body. So when the newborn here is sucking at the mother's breast, the baby's actually triggering tiny nerves within the nipple. And so what happens is when that's happening, the hypothalamus signals the pituitary gland to release, release oxytocin uh, and another hormone called prolactin. All right, and so you can see how that process works. So essentially, the process is prolactin stimulates milk production. The oxytocin stimulates the release of the milk. And then we go back up. The infant sucking stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus signals the pituitary gland again to release the oxytocin and the prolactin. And the loop uh, continues. And a change within this loop is being produced. So because of the baby su uh, suckling here, that causes even more prolactin to be secreted and essentially more milk to be produced. All right, so that's how that loop would look. The reflex called the letdown reflex is what makes the milk in the breast available to the baby, right? And this is a very complex process, right? So there's a lot of things here that even go to the, you know, third semester, you know, uh, third trimester of pregnancy onward. Um, you know, and a lot of different steps here that happen um, to, to regulate this process as well. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this portion here because it does a really good job of showing us uh, the positive feedback loop here that's taking place and how the hormone oxytocin is involved. All right, and also prolactin as well. Okay, oxytocin uh, is also something that we should be aware of that stimulates labor contractions, right? If a woman is late, uh, they can also induce labor by giving an injection. And essentially, the injection is uh, oxytocin. Okay, then we have the uh, thyroid gland that I'd like to talk a little bit about. This is a gland, as you can see, within our neck. This gland is on both sides of the thyroid cartilage, right? The thyroid cartilage of the larynx, uh, the larynx rather, it's on both sides of that, right? We call that the thyroid gland. And um, this is a really important gland for regulating energy and growth and even temperature as well, right? So if we have a normally functioning thyroid gland, you know, we have a normal level of energy typically a normal level of growth. For example, if we have low energy or if we're tired uh, all the time or if we're cold all the time, that can be um, indicative of a, a hypothyroidism. We know that the word hypo, the root hypo means low. So hypothyroidism is shown in those signs, right? You know, of, of a lower level of energy, uh, an excessive tiredness, or, you know, the tendency to be cold, okay? Now, in an adult, it's very much, you know, very easily treated. It's problematic a lot of times if hypothyroidism is found in an infant. And in fact, in a newborn, it can be really serious. New Jersey, I believe, does. And a lot of states do throughout the U.S. As soon as a newborn is born, they actually test for a hypothyroidism because they want to make sure that there is a specific disorder doesn't exist because if it does, it could significantly affect the baby's growth 
the height of the baby, you know, as they grow, the cognition, uh, that's a really big thing as well. And, and so, you know, if they did test positive for this, they would want to start a hormone regimen actually right away. So, you know, that, that could be, again, a pretty serious thing in a, in a newborn or infant, very, very treatable in, in an adult. Okay, so here's a closer look at the thyroid glands. So you can see the surrounding structures here. Here's your thyroid. And then if you take a view from the posterior side, you can see the parathyroid glands. You can only see those, you can't see those on the, on the anterior side. Okay, so you can see where you can see those there. As we continue to scroll, we have another, I don't really think this is a great image, but here's another image. And then let's keep, uh, let's keep the discussion going here. So we've talked about the thyroid. And so now let's jump into the parathyroid gland. So as you were able to see by those pictures that I just showed you, basically the parathyroids are four, there's four parathyroid glands and they're surrounding, we can say the thyroid gland, right? And they produce a parathyroid hormone. And so basically this hormone, you, you see a little bit of this here, and then I'll bring back that conversation I started about the osteocytes, right? Our osteoblasts and our osteoclasts, this would be a good review. But basically, so this parathyroid hormone is produced, and really what's happening is, you know, the opposite effect of, of calcitonin, right? All right, so let's talk about these bone cells, right? Because this relates as well to our study here of the endocrine system. We're talking specifically about calcium, right? When we're talking about, um, uh, you know, calcitonin, you can see that the way they show this is an increase in blood calcium yields and increase, uh, increases in secretion of calcitonin, okay? And a decrease in blood calcium yields increases in secretions of the paroi, uh, parathyroid hormone, okay? So uh, in other words, uh, what's happening here is the osteoblasts, which you see here, are secreting the calcium minerals in our bone tissue, right? And so what do you think the osteoclasts are doing? Right, the osteoclasts are doing the opposite, all right? And so because of that, we have a decrease in calcium uh, in our bloodstream. And thus, we have an increase in calcium in our bones. All right, so the osteoblasts and osteoclasts work off of each other. You might be wondering, because we've really, in each chapter we've done, we've talked about, or at least tried to in most, we talk about pathologies. So I'm kind of also trying to weave this in for our uh, chapter 17 study here. So you might be wondering, well, what if we are, uh, what if we tend to be low in terms of our calcium? You know, what if it runs, you know, outside of the normal range? You know, how do we initially get the calcium in our bloodstream? Well, uh, you know, something as simple as a, you know, a glass or a glass of milk, right? Or, you know, increasing our consumption of something like milk. Uh, that's one example, you know, can increase a calcium. Okay, and then also keep in mind, uh, just um, this brought back another thought into my head. We talked in the muscular system about muscle, you know, contraction, right? So when the osteoclasts are breaking down the secretions from the osteoblasts, they are breaking down essentially the calcium into our bloodstream, right? And by doing that, another way to think of this as part of this process is by doing that, they're allowing for muscle contraction. So while we're on the topic of feedback loops, which will be a common theme here today, let's take a look at this one, all right? So uh, we were talking about the thyroid, right? Thyroid hormone. And so if we are, if our brain is stimulated in the, uh, to say we have low levels of the thyroid hormone, uh, T3 and T4 specifically, uh, low metabolic rate or decreased body temperature, 
then what happens is this loop starts. And so the hypothalamus realizes uh, it needs to fire and release a TRH, right? And then the uh, pituitary gland releases TSH. Those are two of the, two of the hormones there that we talked about from the uh, hypothalamus. And then what happens is we get to the thyroid. The thyroid releases the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. And then since the thyroid was fired to release those hormones, we then had a subsequent increase in the levels of T3 and T4 in our blood. We had an increase to the metabolic rate and an increase to the temperature. All right, and so that feedback loop uh, continues. And then we tell the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus to stop. We're good, right? We're at the correct levels until we are uh, stimulated again at the brain, right? At the cerebral cortex to stimulate uh, another signal to the hypothalamus. Okay, if the level's lower again, we're going to have a signal stimulate again, and that same process is going to be followed. Okay, keep in mind that there's any, um, you know, uh, any specific pathology that's present. You know, there's a chance there could be some um, abnormal functioning of the thyroid. And so, you know, one of the ways to remedy that is through, um, you know, specific medication for that. Here's more looks at some uh, different feedback loops. So uh, these feedback loops are pertinent to the endocrine system. I'm just going to pause here for a couple seconds so you can update your notes. And then next we're going to get into the adrenal gland. With the adrenal gland, so it's important to know that we really have two parts here. We have an inner and an outer part. Those aren't on this slide, but I'll just talk about them uh, briefly. Uh, the inner part is called the adrenal medulla. All right, and the outer part is called the adrenal cortex, okay? You've heard those terms before, right? Those are common anatomical terms. In fact, we use those terms, uh, let's see, specifically medulla and cortex, we were referring to the brain, right? Those represented different areas of our brains. All right, so just like the brain, the uh, adrenal gland has an outer or um, cerebral cortex, an inner or a medulla. Okay, so what exactly does the adrenal gland do? Well, uh, once again, uh, we have nervous system involvement. So we have neurons uh, involved with releasing neurotransmitters. And uh, specifically, um, the neurotransmitter here is epi or epinephrine. And epinephrine is released into the bloodstream. All right, and so what happens is when epinephrine is released into the bloodstream, is um, it could be as a result of something, right? So it could be as a result of you know, stress in general or having to take a, a, a test, right? Or uh, it could even be in response to something like exercising, all right? So uh, we have this adrenal output that happens or this release of the neurotransmitter epinephrine into the bloodstream. And, uh, and that really is the key point here that Important to know. Uh, and so when the epinephrine is uh, released, uh, we have also uh, the outer adrenal cortex doing some work here. Okay, here's the outer cortex. And the outer adrenal cortex basically is secreting a number of different steroid hormones at this point. These hormones are made from cholesterol. And they're basically in two classes. We have mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids. All right, the mineralocorticoids deal with minerals. And basically, in terms of the adrenal glands here, they affect the salt and potassium levels, which in turn, can affect the kidney's retention of salt and water. Okay, and then we have the glucocorticoids. 
Does anybody have a thought as to what those might affect? Try to use your roots there. Gluco. So if you said glucose, you're correct. So those would impact the glucose or the blood sugar. And basically they are bringing the blood sugar levels up. And here's a quick summary. In other words, again, we had the inner adrenal medulla and the outer adrenal cortex with the uh, adrenal medulla representing the neurons that release a neurotransmitter. In this case, it's epinephrine into the bloodstream. And in terms of the adrenal cortex, there is a secretion of a number of steroid hormones, as we said, made from cholesterol. And that segues really nicely for us into the pancreas. It's important to know for the pancreas that this is both an endocrine and exocrine gland, which is very unique because mostly in mostly all the cases, a gland is either endocrine or exocrine. So this is one of the only organs in the body that is both endocrine and exocrine. So let's think about what the pancreas is responsible for. So I'll give you a little hint. It has to also do with blood sugar. One of the key responsibilities of the pancreas is to control blood sugar. And I'll use my phrase again, the yin and yang, right? It maintains the homeostatic effect of the blood sugar. So we want the insulin and the glucagon to be in balance. Right? In the case of diabetes, mellitus, um, what would be the what would be the case here in terms of the blood sugar? Well, the blood sugar would, would most likely be too high because they don't have the insulin, so they're having trouble lowering it, right? So that's why we treat with it with insulin. And so again, we're looking for a balance here. We're looking for control of the blood sugar, and this is one of the responsibilities of the pancreas. Here's another picture here of the pancreas with some surrounding uh, structures and cells. So we can get a good look at the endocrine portion of the pancreas, which we can see here. And you can see here uh, the hormones, insulin and glucagon, as we talked about. Again, it just summarizes that our goal is to maintain the normal blood glucose levels. The normal levels of blood sugar is what we're striving for. Right, as we uh, continue through part two here of our lecture, we move into conversations about the testes and the ovaries. All right, so uh, testis is a, is a term you'll see that's singular, and so that refers to testicle in the male, and then uh, obviously testes is plural. Uh, and then here on the on our right side, we have a image which uh, point out where the ovaries are on the female. It's important to know that um, in terms of the estrogen in a female, it has a counterpart in the male, and that is the testosterone. So we can say that the estrogen, which you see here, is a counterpart to the testosterone. On the other hand, the progesterone does not have a counterpart in the male, right? So the progesterone is basically to prepare for uh, gestation, right? So pregnancy. Right? So uh, the woman's body every month is prepared for possible pregnancy, right? So it promotes the growth of blood vessels in the uh, endometrial. Um, lining of the uterus. And um, if the uh, female becomes pregnant, then the blood vessels would nourish the embryos. Um, if the uh, woman does not get pregnant, then what happens is um, she sheds those blood vessels out of the birth canal, uh, and that's called having a period. So uh, another thing that I want you to note is the placenta, which we can see in this image here. 
So the placenta, not sure if uh, you know this, but the placenta also produces a hormone. And it's a hormone that stimulates the production of progesterone, which we saw here. Right, so basically the progesterone is uh, of the ovaries, right? And uh, the way this works is um, there's a big name here for a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin. All right, so chorionic gonadotropin is what they test for uh, in a pregnancy test. So the only time a woman would have this hormone is if there is a chorionic sac surrounding the uh, surrounding the baby. And then finally, uh, we have the pineal gland. And we're not going to talk a lot about this. Um, I just basically want to mention that this gland is responsible for releasing melatonin. So uh, essentially, it helps regulate our sleep patterns. And then I think this slide really does a good job summarizing the glands, hormones, and functions, many of which we talked about today. Some of the terms may be new, but you can associate a lot of times the gland with the function in the name. And then finally, we have endocrine versus exocrine. So this is something I want to make sure that you know for exam four. Endocrine glands are those that release their secretions into the bloodstream. And so essentially, the blood then carries the substances throughout the body until it reaches its target organ. And on the other hand, the exocrine glands are those glands that directly release their secretion into the target organ or tissue. Right, so it's not going into the bloodstream, it's just going directly to the target organ or tissue. And a lot of times that could be like a, a skin surface type of uh, tissue. So that concludes our lecture of chapter 17. Just to remind you that the mini essays are a great study tool. So definitely make some time to review the lecture. If you have to go back and uh, you can play it a second or third time and uh, use the lecture content to answer the mini essays.